share here. Becky, it was good to see you. Yeah, it was good talking today. to you. So thank you again. Yeah, um, good to talk to you, Becky. Okay, take care. You too. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, everybody. I see folks continuing to trickle in. Um, we've got a real treat for you today. The Hisatsanam chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society is going to pre be presenting a Summer of Reconnections, redocumenting Diné archaeological sites on Chakra Mesa. And we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Davina Two Bears, and she's going to be talking about this project that she's been working on for um, the past couple of years in, in Chaco Canyon. Now, a uh, little introduction from the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Uh, we acknowledge the Pueblo Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickoria Apache, people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission-related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, the present, and the future. So we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant communities for their contributions to all humankind. Uh, Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. And the reason we put this up here, part of this is to get you thinking about your place in the world, to uh, look into the kind of places that you're living. Who are the people whose ancestral lands or current lands uh, are you living on? Uh, and it's really to encourage people to think critically about the places they are and their place in the world. Now, the mission at Crow Canyon is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. You can find out more about us at www.crowcanyon.org. Uh, and we'd like to say thank you for supporting our webinar series. Now, some of you may never have used Zoom before, uh, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of a, an orientation to that. Maybe the most important thing is that you can move the talking heads. Uh, you probably see me floating around somewhere in the upper right-hand side of your screen. If there's something in a slide you'd like to see uh, in more detail or it's covering, you can move, uh, you can move the talking heads. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, interact with us. There's the chat function and there's the Q&A function. We like to use the chat function for sort of general comments back and forth, uh, but save your real questions for the Q&A. If you put them in the Q&A section, uh, myself, Taylor, we will uh, take a look at them and we will try to get to all of your questions. We'll save questions uh, for the end of Dr. Two Bear's talk here, and we'll go through them at that point. If your Zoom isn't working properly, you can head over to our live stream on Facebook uh, you can also subscribe to us on YouTube, and traditionally we will uh, upload the uh, recording of these lecture series uh, onto our YouTube channel. So, so go check that out. It also has probably dozens at this point of, of prior webinars, a, a fantastic resource of some of the, the best information on the culture and archaeology of the, uh, the Southwest that you can get. Well, more than the Southwest. There's, there's many things you can find there. I suggest you check it out. So today, as I said, we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Davina Two Bears. Uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Two Bears participated in redocumenting Diné archaeological sites on Chakra Mesa in Chaco Culture National Historical Park. The Navajo presence is clearly visible from the summer hogans along Chaco Wash to defensive locations atop Chakra Mesa. In this presentation, uh, Davina shares her experience of reconnecting and redocumenting Navajo sites of her Diné relatives on Chakra Mesa. Uh, now, Davina uh, is Diné, originally from Bird Springs, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, she's currently a visiting professor of anthropology and a postdoctoral fellow at Swarthmore College in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. In the summer of 2021, she participated in re-documenting Diné archaeological sites on Chakra Mesa in Chaco Culture National Historical Park. Uh, so, as I said, we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Two Bears here. I'm going to pass this over to Taylor, who I believe will share our PowerPoint.
Can you see my PowerPoint? You're coming through clear. Okay. Should I get started? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Davina. Okay. Yat eh? Shit, Davina, two bears. You know, she had two to cheat me, Nishla, touchy me, Bush's chin. Habahi does a che, do to the chin, he does a nullet. City taught that Nasha, um, Swarthmore College to Nashnish. Hello, everyone. I'm Davina, two bears, and I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm <clears throat> Dene Navajo. And my clan is Bitterwater, and I'm born for Red Running Into the Water clan. Um, my grand, maternal grandfather is Edgewater, and my paternal grandfather is also Bitterwater. And I grew up in northern Arizona in um, the area of uh, Loop and Bird Springs, um, which is near Winslow, Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, and also Tuba City, Arizona. And <clears throat> I just want to um, thank the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center for inviting me to give this talk of my uh, summer of redocumenting um, Navajo sites on Charca Mesa in Chaco uh, National Historical Park, and also um, acknowledge uh, all the indigenous peoples um, in the area of Crow Canyon and um, in the area of Chaco as well. And as I like to say, wherever you are in the Americas, you are on indigenous land. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I just want to start off a little bit about, uh, about me. Um, I, I uh, recently graduated from Indiana University with a PhD in anthropology with an emphasis in archaeology. I um, was in the archaeology of the social context PhD program, which is a program that um, focuses on the social issues surrounding the field of archaeology. So it, it's a different, it's a different program than your more traditional archaeology PhD programs. And I also have a PhD minor in Native American and Indigenous Studies. So I have a, a, ver, a very strong interest in uh, Native American contemporary music as well. And um, <clears throat> my dissertation focused on uh, documenting a historical Navajo site through archival research and oral history interviews of um, a federal Indian boarding school in my community. Um, which was um, in, in Loop, Arizona. It, it was the Loop boarding school and in the early 20th century, it was uh, called the Loop Agency School. But um, both of my grandparents attended school there in the early 20th century. And they told me stories about this place. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to uh, research this school. And also because the history of this boarding school had never been documented um, um, in the literature. So I also had um, an opportunity to work for my tribe. That was something that I always wanted to do. And I was able to work for the Navajo Nation. Uh, at the time, there was a Navajo Nation archaeology department. And I was in the student training program. Um, we learned how to do <laughs> cultural resources inventories on the Navajo Nation um, as part of the development process. And then later on, I became the program manager of uh, the Northern Ar Arizona University branch office. So I worked for the Navajo Nation for a total of 14 years, um, first in the early 90s and then in the 2000s. And then I decided to go back to school. So I was a non-traditional PhD student when I went back to school in um, 2010 in um, Indiana. Uh, <clears throat> but what, what um, I, I, I was invited to uh, work on this project with um, Ruth Van Dyke, who 
was asked by the National Park Service to uh, if she would be interested in redocumenting some archaeological sites on Charca Mesa. And at the time, Ruth Van Dyke was, um, she just immediately jumped at the opportunity. Um, and when she got the information about the sites, she realized that they were Navajo sites. And she, she um, of course, Ruth, you know, as some of you may know, her focus is on uh, ancient uh, sites in Chaco Canyon and landscape archaeology. And so this was a different um, type of project for her. Uh, she had, you know, she had, has not studied Navajo archaeology. And so she also felt it was very important to invite Navajo um, archaeologists to participate in this project. So this is just a map of the uh, Chaco Culture National Historical Park. And um, the Charca Mesa is, um, it's, you, you can see, um, I guess, I don't know how to, how to describe where it is, but um, it is, I guess you could say, um, I guess it's south southeast of the visitor center. And um, it is, we would often park at the site of Wadiji, um, which which you would um, there's a dirt road that goes to this site. So then we would take that dirt road and park there and then hike in to Charca Mesa, which was across the Chaco Wash. But in any case, Ruth Van Dyke um, had asked several Navajo archaeologists if they would like to participate on this project. And um, I was free that summer. And so as soon as she asked me, I was just like, yes, you know, this was something that I just was very, very excited about. Um, because I have never worked at Chaco and I just really wanted to have the opportunity to do some to do some work there. And also, especially, you know, of course, because these were historical Navajo sites. So I think what's um, really important for me to emphasize is that, you know, I've always known that there are Navajo sites in um, the Chaco National Park but I just never um, had seen them myself. Of course, you know, I have, I have uh, visited Chaco, you know, just maybe like three times in my lifetime. And it was just, you know, going to all of the, the sites that all the tourists go to. So, um, but I, because I worked for the Navajo Nation, I know that there were there was a specific program with the Historic Preservation Department, the, the Navajo sites, um, Chaco sites protection program. So I did know that there were Navajo sites that existed in Chaco, but I just didn't realize until um, I got, I started working on this project that there are so many Navajo sites in Chaco on Charca Mesa um, at the base of Charca Mesa, it, you know, the occupation is extensive. Um, really, you can't walk very far uh, without running into a historical Navajo site. And it, it really just blew my mind. Um, once I, I started working on this project, uh, how many, how many sites there were um, on, on Charca Mesa. Uh, these historical Navajo sites, I, and um, we, I think we redocumented about 20 um, that the Park Service, they, uh, every, I think they said every 20 years, they would like for um, an archaeologist uh, crew to go out to visit various Navajo sites at, on Charca Mesa, uh, in this instance, and to just kind of um, document what we see. Uh, we, we were noting any damage to the site. Uh, some of the sites had um, elk trails that went through them and or um, sometimes cattle will get into the park. 
And so um, some of the sites were being trampled on by cattle um, or my, it could have been an elk too, I'm not sure. So, but, um, so we were remapping these sites and we were um, using um, uh, not the, the traditional uh, tools that I learned how to use, which is a compass and metric tape, but we were using tablets and um, um, uh, carrying around a little, like a, I don't know, some kind of a, a satellite reader to take points. And then we would upload those points um, into um, the computer uh, in the evening. So this was something different for me. So we were uh, recording the sites with these with a tablet and also taking photographs of them. And then we did though write um, our notes down using pencil and paper with the forms that the Park Service wanted us to use. So we had to find all of these sites. And then we also had to um, re-identify a lot of the features that were on the uh, site maps that were, you know, sometimes 20, 30 years old. Um, and so it was, it was um, such a, an amazing experience for me. Um, this is another picture to give you an idea of what uh, Charca Mesa looks like. So you can see that there's a lot of these, what they call ring cons. And they, um, in, in these areas here, if hopefully you can see the arrow that I'm moving. There's uh, springs in, in some of these. We did see one of, um, we saw a spring in one of these ring cons. And then um, on top, of the Mesa, there were archeological sites as well as at the base of um, these, uh, the Charca Mesa, there were um, uh, historic Navajo sites as well. So <clears throat> just to give you an idea that actually these sites have been extensively studied and I am still reading myself and learning from the work that has already been published in the 60s and 70s, starting with Gwen Vivian's work, um, his master's thesis, and also, you know, one of um, uh, the book that I really have been reading a lot is David Brugge's book from 1986. And um, there's even some work that has been done on rock art that we didn't know of until we were looking at the, the library at Chaco. And so there is a lot of um, work that has already been published and uh, a lot of uh, these sites that we were looking at had already been excavated and um, uh, written about, for example, by David Brugge. And um, <clears throat> I think that's one thing that uh, we noticed right away that a lot of these sites didn't have very many artifacts associated or inside, like, for example, uh, inside the Hogans, because they had already been excavated and uh, collect those artifacts collected um, by, by the uh, archaeologists um, from previous projects. So, uh, you know, another one of my uh, realizations is that um, this, this work is quite extensive and the archaeological Navajo sites are, you know, pretty much everywhere um, on Charca Mesa, at the base of Charca Mesa, like I was saying. But it's really interesting to me that um, none of these places are part of the park. You know, they're not they're not um, part of uh, the places where tourists can uh, visit. Um, and, you know, I hope that the National Park Service, and I think they are going to start like um, interpreting these sites for the public to learn about and to include in, in um, the park as places that people can visit. 
because you know they these sites are really really old sites and they're quite beautiful and stunning and i i would really like to see that you know that um the navajo presence is also um you know i guess part of the park's history and you know i feel that 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 also should should be shared and um with with the public and with tourists so I just hope that the park will continue to um, or go further with these these sites and you know developing um, a part the Navajo history part of the um, Chaco National Park. So, you know, I feel like there are many sites that are, for example, near Wajiji where tourists can access. And one of them was um, a couple of Hogan sites from the early 20th century that we, what these were like the first couple of sites that we documented. And they were really um, quite stunning. They're really good examples of early 20th century Navajo stone Hogan sites. And um, this, this Hogan, was um, also at the base of a very famous site that David Brugge recorded, which has several components, and that is the dollhouse site. And you know, this would be a really good, a really good place to show tourists because they have not only in this area uh, a really unique um, feature, which is the tiny little quote unquote dollhouse. Um, but they also have this really nice example of a early 20th century Navajo Hogan. And inside this Hogan, um, to the left, inside the wall, you can still see the plaster um, that was put there by the family. And then on top of the mesa, um, this, this Hogan is at the base, and on top of um, the, the mesa there, Charka Mesa, there were these really old um, Navajo historical, um, probably dating to, uh, according to David Ruby, the 1700s. Um, so this site had, you know, this more contemporary example at the base of the mesa, and on top had several uh, Hogan rings from that dated to the 1700s. So most of the, the arche Navajo archeological sites that I have recorded with the Navajo Nation have been early 20th century Navajo Hogans on the Western side of the Navajo reservation. So I didn't really ever get an opportunity to work on the Eastern side when I was working for the Navajo Nation. So um, it was just so mind blowing to me to, to be in Hogan rings that were dating to the 1700s. And they were often made of stone. And just like, um, you know, how traditional Navajos are taught to, uh, our Hogans are always facing east, the doorway. And these Hogans, uh, there were some that, that might, might were, uh, there was a few that didn't face east, but th they were mostly, um, those ones were mostly built against some sandstone bedrock. So, um, but for the most part, these Hogan's, their doorways faded, faced east. And the, the Hogan's on this, that were on this mesa um, behind this 20th century Hogan here, um, they were, also built right along the the edge or the cliff into very defensive locations where you could see really far um, along the Chaco um, along Chaco Canyon and and um, one of the one of these hogans also look like a, a pueblito from a Dineta area in Northwest New Mexico. So it wasn't actually, it was more built more like a square and it was it was um, taller 
and also it had windows where you could look out of and I'd never I'd never you know seen anything like that on the western Navajo reservation so this was a really unique um unique architecture that I was seeing and um and also the fact that these hogans were built right on the cliff's edge. It was kind of scary for me because I, I'm kind of afraid of heights. So just, you know, standing uh, or recording these hogans that were built like right on the edge of the cliffs. Like if you tripped, you could, you know, fall <laughs> and definitely uh, injure yourself if you, if you uh, fell off that cliff because it, it was pretty high. Um, sorry, it was pretty high and um, um, very unique, very unique uh, locations um, right there on the cliff's edge in these defensive defensive um, positions. So these were some of the first sites that we recorded, and um, they were definitely really amazing. Um, oh, uh, here's a picture of the plaster. You can see in between um, the, the sandstone. And this um, across, across the, um, um, on the opposite side of the Rincon where the early 20th century Hogan, there was corrals and Again, this was a different kind of corral. Most of the corrals that I've seen um, are made of juniper branches, but since there's so many, you know, uh, sandstone boulders and rocks available, this a lot of the uh, sheep corrals in Chaco are actually made of this local sandstone. And what I really liked um, about this uh, Corral also, there was also in, inside the corral along the boulders, there was a Navajo rock art and someone had um, sketched or scratched a, a Navajo rug design on one of the, the boulders. So it, it was really impressive as well that um, a lot of the boulders had Navajo rock art uh, on Chaka Mesa at the base of Charca Mesa, I mean, you, it, it was like they were drawing everywhere. You could find um, Navajo rock art. And in particular, one of the favorite motifs was um, horses that they liked to scratch into the boulders. And, <clears throat> oh, here's, here's a picture of some of the Hogans that are on um, top of the Mesa of the dollhouse site. And um, you can see the photo on the left that this Hogan is built like right on the edge of the cliff. So, and then um, on the right is Ruth and some national park workers, but you can't really tell, but they're, they're pretty much standing um, on the edge of the cliff right there. So the dollhouse again has this little feature, which actually, looks, um, it's like a miniature, um, a miniature sandstone uh, square house. And I'm, I've, I'm, have never seen anything like this. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what, um, you know, what it, it symbolizes or what, you know, the significance of it. Um, but I definitely want to know more or learn more. And it's kind of in this little alcove. Um, so it seemed like they, they, they built it in this, you know, little alcove. And so, you know, it's, it's a miniature house. Um, and I just, um, I thought it was a very unique um, feature. And I would like to know more about it. And we were really, really uh, lucky that we could um, relocate it. It took us um, several days before we could find it, but um, it's kind of hidden away. So, uh, but we were, we were able to figure out um, one of the students who, who was working uh, on the crew and we were able to figure out where, where it was at.
So yeah, and it's, its location is kind of hidden and hard to get to. So that, you know, makes, makes it more of um, like, it makes one wonder why, you know, it's kind of in a hidden location. It's built in a nice little alcove there. And, you know, what, what is, is its significance? So um, one of the things that I also uh, learned while I was out there is that a lot of these early um, Hogans from the 1700s were, you know, double Hogans. So I usually, um, the Hogans that I have recorded um, on the Western half of the reservation, they're, um, I, they're just uh, single structures usually made out of juniper. Sometimes they are made out of sandstone, uh, like in the Cameron, Arizona area where there's a lot of sandstone. But um, I had never seen double Hogans. And a lot of these early um, Hogans that date to the 1700s, like it seemed like almost at, almost like at every site that we, every Navajo site, uh, early Navajo site, there was um, a double Hogan. So it was like um, two Hogan rings connected together. And sometimes you could not tell where, if sometimes they had separate doorways, but sometimes um, they had uh, one doorway and then they, then you could see um, a doorway between the two Hogans um, where they were connected. So it was a really interesting um, architecture to me because when you think of Hogans, you always think of a round structure or which in Navajo, it's the female Hogan is the round, round structure and the, the pointed um, forked stick Hogan is the male Hogan. And so, you know, I've seen those, um, I, I've seen those, but I had never seen, um, uh, a double Hogan. Um, so that was something, a unique architectural feature of um, these Hogans that were from the set, dated to the 1700s that we were um, uh, encountering <laughs> on a regular basis. And this picture um, was, the pictures here were near the Shabikasi uh, site um, and um, also near this Shibikasi site, there was a really cool uh, wagon trail that you could see that was sloping up to the top of Charca Mesa. And um, on top of that uh, wagon trail, there were some more Hogans that were there as well on top of the, the wagon trail. So but these pictures um, are um, some, some of the students that were uh, on, on the project, KP and Liv. So also um, what, one of the things that was really exciting for me is that um, I, when I, I, you know, I've done a lot of survey work, but mostly again on the Western Navajo reservation. And I had, really, I hadn't really ever seen Navajo uh, rock art. But on Charca Mesa, like I said, it's quite extensive. And you can see um, there's a like a cattle here on the photograph to the left. And then you can see here in this middle photograph, uh, this corn stalk um, that, that um, is in the middle part of this photograph. And then also some, probably a horse figure here. And then um, probably some religious uh, type of um, rock art here on the right. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure what uh, deity that is, but, <clears throat> but um, it was this rock art, all three of these examples we're at a really um, uh, secluded, well, every place was pretty secluded, but there was this site 
there was an early 20th century Navajo site that was kind of in this sandstone um, uh, secluded area, which would be a good place to, I think, live to keep you away from the cold winds. And the Hogan wasn't there anymore, but you could see the ring where, where it would have been, the, you know, the depression. And um, it was um, right behind where the Hogan would have been was this huge, this huge wall of, of um, sandstone rock art. And, <clears throat> It was amazing. I'd never seen anything like that. You know, uh, the family that lived there was pretty much um, drawing rock art all along that uh, sandstone wall that was behind the um, Hogan. And it was pretty amazing. And these, these pictures here were on some of the um, drawings that were on that um, that sandstone wall behind the Hogan. So <clears throat> what was really cool as well about that site was that um, I have never found a arrowhead. I have found pieces of an arrowhead. I have found a couple of um, lithic tools like drills, but I had never found um, a projectile point. And it was at this site um, where, you know, there's this huge wall of uh, rock art, Navajo rock art. They had an ash pile and I was um, uh, looking at the ash pile and I see this beautiful pink projectile point right, right on top. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I finally found an arrowhead. And um, Ruth, she sent it to her friend who's, who uh, is an expert in um, lithic uh, technology of the Southwest. And she, just by looking at the photograph, she estimated that it was perhaps um, dating to the early archaic or about 8,000 years old. So I was, I, I mean, I was so happy and I think it was such a beautiful point. And also in the same ash pile, again, right on top was this um, um, abrader here. And so, this was a, you know, also a really unique and beautiful, um, you know, example of some of the, the tools that this family may have used. But again, I was, I wanted, you know, I was questioning, um, I wonder why this beautiful uh, point was in the ash pile, like, because, you know, in, in the net culture, you use these for ceremonial purposes and also they're like protection when you find them. And so it was interesting to me that it was in the ash pile as if, you know, someone had um, thrown it out and put it there. But then again, you know, these sites have already been, you know, recorded um, by previous, um, you know, archaeologists. So maybe it, it was uh, put there by one of the archaeologists that had recorded the site. So we did have, you know, the notes from, from um, uh, the sites that, that we were um, redocumenting, but I don't remember uh, reading about, you know, anything about this point in, in, in the, um, the site documentation for this site. So, but this site was is was very impressive to me just because of the extensive rock art and also these um, really beautiful uh, tools that um, were found at this early 20th century Navajo site. And this site we had to hike in uh, pretty far to get to it. 
So it's so funny, like the beginning of the summer, I could barely hike to uh, from Wajiji to across the um, Chaco Wash and um, just probably like, I don't know, it was probably like not maybe not even a mile away from the parked car. And it was just really difficult uh, because of the sand and the heat. But by the end of the summer, you know, we were walking like six, eight miles, no problem. <laughs> Um, so near this, uh, on top of Charca Mesa, um, we did, we did, uh, find this large, uh, fire cracked scatter. Um, we were, we walked over it, I think, and, and we, we, we were just looking at it and thinking what this looks interesting. I, it, it Definitely, it's not natural. It's there's it's like um. It's there's some there was something here, so again, this is a feature that I have never encountered before. It was like a large um, roasting pit and had uh, a lot of fire cracked rock, and kind of like in this drainage. So I'm you know I I don't know um, what it was, but you know I. It, it was just, it just stood out to us. And um, so we, we recorded it, um, but you know, this is the kind of uh, feature that I would like to know more about, especially with, you know, my ancestors and, you know, what, what they were doing to make this, this site here. Uh, you know, what, what were they, were they uh, roasting pinions or, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I would like to um, look into this further to learn more about um, this feature, this very unique feature that I, I have never seen before. Ruth has, hasn't ever seen before either. So it was a very unique feature, but it really stood out and, um, um, yeah, so we, so as part of the project, we also recorded new uh, sites uh, that we, or I guess you could say new components to the sites that we were redocumenting. So we would find, for example, we found a lot of rock art that wasn't recorded at the sites that we were redocumenting. And sometimes there were features that were not recorded when these sites were originally recorded. So then we would, we would record those sites. Uh, this is just an example of some of the pottery we were finding. We were finding a lot of early Navajo pottery. And that was also something very, um, a, a new experience for me as well was um, encountering Navajo pottery. And we also, in a couple of instances, found um, Pueblo tra trade wares at these sites as well. And I'm so mad at myself, I didn't take any picture pictures, <coughs> excuse me, pictures. But what I really like about this shirt was that you can see the scrape marks um, on, on the outside of the shirt here in the middle. And um, I could just imagine them, for example, maybe using a corn cob to make those scrape marks, but I, I don't know if that's what they actually used, but um, it was again, really um, um, a great experience for me to see uh, so much Navajo pottery and um, uh, it, most of it, like you see here, is um, <clears throat> plain and not painted. It, the, the only ones that were painted were, was the uh, Pueblo trade wear. And I also had an opportunity to record this, um, again, uh, Navajo rock art site. And I know that this definitely has religious um, significance and but I'm I don't know what that is 
but um, there was only like a sketch of this large panel that uh, Randy McGuire and I, it took us all day um, to make this map. I drew the map and he just told me the measurements of where each of these um, lines were located. And so you can see my, my map on the right that I drew. So I, I felt really lucky um, to be able to draw such a, a beautiful um, representation of Navajo rock art and also, um, you know, to, to, to document it in more detail than it had been uh, previously. So I felt, you know, that um, I was very proud of the work that Randy and I did. Like I said, it took us all day and it was so hot uh, sitting in the sun uh, drawing this map, but, you know, I think we, we did a really um, good job. So one of the final sites that we went to was also a real um, emotional experience for me. Uh, this beautiful Hogan um, site was one of the far, farthest ones that we had to hike to to get to. And it, it represents, again, a beautiful early 20th century Navajo site. And the reason why it's so sad for me is because um, the family that lived in this beautiful place was removed when Chaco became a park. And um, just knowing that um, it really, you know, you can't help but think about it when you're there. You can't help but picture the family that was there that invested their, you know, this was their home, this was their life, this was where they raised their children. There was a wagon, a little rusted wagon out there. Um, and it was really emo emotional when I went to the site. Uh, I just, was looking at this Hogan and looking in, inside through the door and I just started crying because, because the Navajo family had to leave. They were forced to leave their home. Um, this is uh, also a bread oven that was at the site. There was many beautiful features at the site and <clears throat> Uh, there was also some corrals made out of wood. And then on the right, you, you see here some kind of trough. Um, also, this log on the right had uh, a trough that was um, chinked out here in the, the middle of the log. And um, uh, I think Ruth asked one of um, the Navajo archaeologists, uh, Wade, about that, what he thought it was. And I think he said, because we were thinking, well, that seems small to put water in there, but um, uh, Wade was suggested, I think, that maybe it could have been where they put salt for the livestock. But what was also really emotional about this site was these red ha handprints that were in the alco alcove. And um, when I first started as an ar archaeologist, one of my Navajo, traditional Navajo uh, archaeological archaeologist um, colleagues told me that during the long walk when um, the Navajo people were rounded up and uh, by the United States government and forcibly marched over, you know, 400 miles to Fort Sumner, New Mexico and imprisoned there at Bosque Redondo from 1864 to 1868. Um, you know, a lot of our people died um, in route and also while they were imprisoned at uh, Fort Sumner. And it's called Huelte, the place of sorrow in Navajo. And um, luckily, you know, we weren't sent to Oklahoma, which was the original plan. They wanted to send us to Indian territory, but we were allowed to return to our reservation. And my Navajo colleague told me that a lot of families, when they return from Puerto, they painted 
put their red handprints um, near their homesteads. And so when we saw, when I saw this, uh, it, it hurt even more uh, to know that this family probably did that when they came back from Fort Sumner. Um, and also, uh, what also I, um, I learned was that a lot of these families that lived here are from the Tutchitney clan, and that's my father's clan. And so I'm, I'm, I'm closely related to these families that were here. So it was a very emotional, it still is an experience for me to um, just know that my family was essentially evicted or chased out of their own homes when uh, this park was created. So, um, yeah, so that's, you know, I, I, I didn't realize that I, I um, was related to these families until, until, you know, the project got started. And I met some of the Navajo staff there at Chaco who are descendants of the people who got, um, who were told to leave when, when Chaco became a national park. And they were grateful to see me there. You know, they expressed to me that they were glad to see someone like them um, because I think they often always see non-Native archaeologists or non-Navajo archaeologists doing work at Chaco. And so they expressed to me that they were happy to see me there um, working on, on this project. So I just, you know, really want to encourage um, national parks to really, um, you know, I know that a lot of parks are doing better in collaborating with tribes and, um, <clears throat> And I think that trend needs to continue. And also, I really hope that Chaco begins to interpret the Navajo sites and to share the Navajo history of Chaco more with um, the public and all of the tourists that come to Chaco. But I just wanted to thank um, everyone. Oh, here's some close-up pictures of the, the handprints that were there. And underneath this um, alcove area was a sheep, a sheep corral. So when you stand, when you stand there close, you can really still smell the manure. It's still a very strong smell. Uh, this is just a picture of me crossing um, the Chaco Wash one day when it was running. And uh, yeah, so this is a picture of. Um, part of our crew and some visitors as well. Uh, Gwen Vivian, I believe was in that picture. So I just wanna thank um, Crow Canyon for inviting me and um, also um, just uh, all of you for listening to me today. Yeah. Well, Davina, thank you so much for uh, for sharing that with us. I think it's really tough for uh, non-native archaeologists to fully understand the uh, the emotional connection to places that native people have. I mean, certainly for me, most of the time I'm working with archaeology that are not my ancestors, except when I'm doing you know an industrial coal mine outside of Gallup or something like that. Uh, so I really appreciate you bringing that perspective to all of us as someone who is working almost directly with your, your own ancestors. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A, uh, and I think I'll, I'll work my way through these. Um, one question is, are there ancestral Pueblo sites on Chakra Mesa? And I think something that might be helpful to people as well is explaining a little bit about 
Um, why sometimes the term Anasazi does get used uh, when Navajo archaeologists are working with the park. I know that's a big topic and we don't have to go down that rabbit hole, but I am, I think it's interesting and people would find it interesting to know more about that. So yes, are there Pueblo sites out there on Chakra Mesa too? Oh yeah, there are. There are. Um, and, and even some of those, uh, like the, the first site, Hogan site that I show you, showed you, there was another early 20th century Hogan that was really near this, that Hogan. And um, essentially they built it right on top of uh, ancient, ancient site. Um, you could see the outline of um, the, the, the um, ancestral Puebloan site uh, and the Hogan was like pretty much built like adjacent to it. So yeah, there was a lot of, um, there, there are a lot of ancient sites like Shibikasi. I mean, that was probably like the biggest one that we saw. Um, and does that date to, what is, is that, what kind of, how, how a, that's a basket maker yeah. three early to, to late. Uh, yeah it's yeah it's a stunning sight mm -hmm. yeah so right again close to Shibikasi where was the a double hogan there and some other um uh hogans not too far away from that site so yeah and you know uh the Na navajo uh nation i believe their official i don't know if it still is that but when i was working there they prefer to use a nas as it because it it um, in our oral history and our clan history, a lot of our clans descend from um, Pueblo Pueblo peoples and even places ancient sites that were um, occupied. We had relations with um, those the people in these ancient sites. Um, we have oral history of uh, interacting or trading with them. And so that's how we got some um, uh, clans as well. And so in Navajo traditions, we you know consider the ancient peoples um, uh, part of our, you know, our ancestors as well. And um, from you know from my from what has been explained to me that that Anas says it is doesn't necess it doesn't it it more replies or it more interprets uh, into the word as old ancestors and so um, rather than the common definition of enemy ancestors. So we're not being intentionally disrespectful um, to, you know, Pueblo nations, but we're, I guess, trying to honor our clan and oral history that we have a, about our interactions with ancient Pueblo people. It, and it's a complicated history. So, so thank you for, for explaining that for folks. Uh, something else that people wanted a little clarification on are male and female Hogans. Uh, are they typically found together on the same sites? Uh, what's the significance to these different kinds of structures? Yeah, um, yeah, they could, they could be. I mean, you know, on the Western side of the Navajo reservation, you know, they could be. Um, one thing interesting of uh, the the older Navajo site, oldest Navajo sites are mostly found in Dineta, which is northwest New Mexico, and they're often these poblito sites. And Ron Townsend has written a couple of books on um, Dineta and poblitos, and he's you know his theory theory is that they were built in these defensive positions. And they're not, and they don't look like hogans. Again, they're you know more like towers, and they're usually built in hard to get to places. 
and they they often have those windows where you could look out of but a lot of and i've been to some of those uh pueblito sites in northwest new mexico New Mexico, and it's really interesting uh, associated uh, or fork stick hogans were also built adjacent to those pueblitos. I didn't ever see round hogans, um, but maybe that doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's just my limited knowledge of pueblito sites. Um, and early Navajo archaeology. This is an area that I'm just being introduced to with this, you know, project that I'm doing on Charca Mesa. So I'm learning as well about my own history. But from what I've seen um, of the Pueblito sites, the early uh, Pueblito sites built in the 1700s, um, they have associated that with them only the fork stick togons. So that's a, that's a really um, interesting question, and I'm definitely not the expert, but you know I think that 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 question is a good one to um, you know explore further, like um, where round hogans are built versus where male hogans are built, and when. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the architecture of these, there's a surprising amount of variation I've found, at least I, I've worked more in the Chuska Valley, uh, but even there, I really had to start keeping track and paying attention when I you know, drive past someone's house and ask questions. Um, there's a question here. Uh, did any of your documentation include interviewing Navajos that may still reside in the area around Chaco Canyon? Yeah, no, we didn't. We didn't do any interviews with um, the families there that still live and um, reside around Chaco. Um, the 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 goal of our project, or what the Park Service wanted us to do, was just to redocument these existing sites, which they do, like I said, every like twenty years or so, and just making sure that you know um, that these sites are. I guess keeping track of how how these sites are doing there out on the landscape. So I think we had a really um, really unique opportunity because I don't think very many people get to you know hike around in in, in these areas um, that are really just stunningly beautiful and the sites are you know just amazing as well. So yeah, that wasn't part of our, our scope of work, but I hope that in the future, there'll be some, like I said, some more um, interpretation of these sites and, and um, making the, you know, them available for people to visit, including, and this is what I said in my talk um, that I did on this topic a couple of weeks ago, that, you know, including, you know, the families as well, giving them an opportunity to participate in collaborating with them and also the chance to you know come and see these places where their ancestors once lived um, that you know they were um, um, evicted from so you know you know working with families and collaborating with them and to get some information about um, these places as well. You know, there's some research that has already also been done on the oral history. Um, I think there, you know, there was some um, <clears throat> research, I think it was in the 80s that really did a lot of oral history of uh, Navajo oral history of Chaco. So, um, but again, you know, a lot of this information um, again, it's it's not really being shared with with the public. Well, I think that's an absolutely great point about finding ways to bring the people surrounding Chaco Canyon, who many, if not most of them, are descended from the people who were um, essentially forcibly removed again, you know, in the 1950s. Um, mm -hmm. Finding ways to bring them uh, back in connection with their own places. Um, and the work I did on the west side of Chaco, that absolutely was the case where people still had really strong connections to places just on the other side of a fence, you know, 
that fence wasn't there 40, 50 years ago. Um, and, and that actually leads to another question. Are there possibly Navajo sites on West Mesa and South Mesa? Like how extensive is the distribution uh, within Chaco Canyon? I'm sure there are. And I think uh, Wade is going to be speaking. Is Wade gonna be speaking at some point? I don't know, that's a good question. Um, It'd yeah. be great if he did. There, I'm not the only Navajo archaeologist working at Chaco right right now. The, there's another young man, uh, Wade Campbell, who's also doing some work on Chaco and um, in a different area. Um, and so um, I haven't heard him speak. I don't think he's given any talks yet about his work. Well, he might have given a talk at Pe Pecos, though. Anyway. <clears throat> um, I mean, I'm sure there are. I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure there are. But um, I think since he's been surveying different parts, he than than what um, than where we were at on Charca Mesa, I think it would be cool to hear what he's also been doing and learning. I think he, and I think some of their initial results from that, from Wade's work, might be, there might have been a blog post on Archaeology Southwest oh, yeah. website, that's, and that was the same as his Pecos talk, okay. um, but I think you can find some information there as well, um, yeah. not to put a plug in for our, uh, our, our sister organization. <laughs> um, Got another question here about defensive locations, defensive positions. Uh, what what exactly do you mean by that? And uh, and maybe as a follow up, what are they defending against? Yeah, in the 1700s, um, according to Ron Townsend's book, defending the the Dineta, he I think he's theorizing that um, a lot of these uh, def Hogans that were built in defensive areas. So these, again, are hard to reach places. They're hard to get to. Um, they're like um, right at the edge of, they're built on right at the edge of cliffs with a very um, steep wall. And also they could also be built on top of um, almost like, almost like a, a boulder. Um, so they're harder to reach. And also, um, this is a time period when there was a lot of raiding by um, between different tribes. For, for example, the Navajo people were um, experiencing raiding from um, Utes and uh, Comanches. And that's what um, Ron Townsend's book uh, theorizes that many of the early Pueblito sites were built in defensive or hard to reach places in response to the raiding that was going on, um, particularly from the Utes and Comanches. The Comanche aspect of that was totally news to me uh, when I first heard that. I didn't. I would not have thought of that part of New Mexico uh, as being involved in that. But um, I mean, increasingly learning that that's the case. Well, I got one more question, um, and that's sort of what are your hopes for the future of this project? Good question. I think. I think what I would really again. I would really like for um, Navajo history to be part of Chaco. That's basically um, what I would like, you know, I would like um, to see, you know, the Navajo, um, these sites be interpreted and ideally like the park could do some collaborative projects with, with the Navajo people and um, maybe, um, um yeah Navajo archaeologists and to develop you know uh maybe trails or or some other you know ways to um just make these sites uh available to um visitors who come to Chaco so that the Navajo history isn't 
silenced or invisible. I mean, it was even invisible to me as a, as an archaeologist. You know, I I don't see when you go to Chaco, you don't see anything really about the Navajo history. So, I hope that you know the Park Service will will start to include um, you know Navajo history in in aspect as part of the Chaco Canyon it, overall experience. Well, that'd be great. I mean, I'm guessing that numerically there's practically as many Navajo sites as the uh, the more ancient Pueblo sites. Um, well, Dr. Two Bears, thank you so much. Really appreciate having you on. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn from you uh, and to see these great photos of the work that you've been doing and to hear about the project. Um, so, so thanks very much for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you all for uh, listening to me. My throat's a little scratchy. I think I'm catching a cold, but it, it was my pleasure. And I really hope to continue to be involved in this work. It's just, it's, it's an amazing place. And I, I really would love to go back and be involved. Excellent. Well, and thank you as well to all of our viewers. Um, you may have noticed that we didn't have a upcoming webinar uh, announcement on this. There's going to be a little bit of a pause as we move into a time of the year when people are starting to focus on their own families, but we will be back. So stay tuned. <laughs>